All right, yeah. <clears throat> Hi, and welcome to Sage for H, uh, and welcome to the PhD interview series. The idea is that we will interview PhD students or former PhD students about their PhD experience uh, so that we can get into the world of uh, PhDs. Uh, and with me, I have uh, Derek Becker, who is not a PhD student. He's an assistant professor, right? Yes. Yeah. At the very moment. But uh, you did your PhD how many years ago? Oh, God, don't make me feel old. Uh, a little over 10 years ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'll be associate soon. So yeah. Okay. Soon associate professor uh, yeah. at yeah. Nottingham University Malaysia yeah. campus. Yep. Um, so yeah, let's talk about your PhD experience. Hmm. Um, why did you want to do a PhD? You know, I honestly have no idea. <laughs> uh, I I actually started university when I was very young by American standards. You know, I went to university when I was sixteen. And I extended it, you know, for a while. I enjoyed being in college. And then I took a year off where I thought, all right, I'm going to save money and travel or I'll be a ski bum. Uh, but I ended up working at a university. So they let me get another degree. And so I managed to use university money to go abroad. And then I traveled and I thought, I'm going to stick with academia because it gives me a lot of flexibility. And so I went into grad school because I knew that, you know, the academic calendar, spring semester, fall semester, you have time off and there's a rhythm. Mm -hmm. And I knew that, you know, you could always, there were no, there was no set rule. If something mm -hmm. interests you today, you follow it. If something mm -hmm. different interests you tomorrow, you follow it. And mm -hmm. so you don't have to do that. There's a lot of flexibility to that, what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I kind of got into it. I was interested in pursuing it for a while just to see what it was, but Every summer at grad school, I'd travel somewhere. I took a year off of grad school and lived in France. I'm not saying that was the wisest thing. I actually thought I was having a mental breakdown because I didn't understand why on earth we did this. But I came back just fine. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think I had a plan. I don't think I have a plan for what I'm doing now, you know, other than feeding the baby here in a little bit. <laughs> That's the only thing I have a plan for. Yeah, so, so would you say that you, you mentioned mental breakdown and... Uh, and we could perhaps uh, say anxiety. Is, is that uh, unnecessary? Is that, is that a common part of the PhD process, would you say? I don't think so, but I took to heart those questions about like, what is the nature of social reality? What is, and fundamentally, what can I say about the world? And it seemed like there was a lot of wishy-washiness to it in mm. terms of what I could get away with uh, honestly saying. And it was uncomfortable. And also, you know, the way in which they, you know, try and smash your idealistic ideas of, of politics and, and what you would want to do in the world with your degree and, and whatnot, cram you into these kinds of ideas about uh, what is tr good scholarship or not, you know, being an orthodox versus what I became a heterodox scholar. Mm. And I took time off and I realized that the wishy-washiness of the world was actually fundamental, truly mm. fundamental, even on a natural, physical level that there is a certain ambiguity out there and that mm. truth claims can become not relative. I, I, I avoid that term, but mm. a little bit more time stamped, a little, a little more limited, but that didn't change anything because I, as a human, am time stamped and limited and my truth today will be different than it will be for the next generation, just as it was before that. Mm. And I also began to find those scholars who pointed out to me that don't come into this with some idea of greatness or anything like that. Do it because you like it. Mm. And I mm. truly do <clears throat> like what I do. I change it. You know, I started off doing you know, economic policy in South Africa, and now I'm studying human consciousness and social worlds. Mm. You yeah. can really just kind of follow it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, actually that actually touches upon um, the next question. So uh, what was your PhD about? I mean, we, we, <laughs> we might perhaps get back to the, the anxiety part and so on. But, but no, I didn't have anxiety. Yeah, yeah no, okay, but a mental breakdown issue. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, so yeah, in, well, yeah. In, ter in terms of uh, how I understand them as a Swede, they're quite closely related uh, concepts. But in any case, <laughs> um, um, what was your PhD about after uh, you finally settled and started writing and decided what what it should be all about? What, what was it all about? 
Well, after a very chance encounter with uh, Peter Katzenstein at the Institute for Qualitative Research Methods, is a nice thing I think all PhD students doing qualitative methods should do. He mm. gave a lecture on case selection, and you know, you know all the, the nuanced details of why you choose your cases, whatever. But he was telling me, he's like, you know, at a certain point, where do you want to spend, you know, several months to a year or more doing research? And I thought, mm. I want to go to South Africa for a little while. So I knew that's what I want to do, and it was a question of like, all right, what am I going to study? And then, you know, the more you dive into, it, you realize, you know, the transition from apartheid to post-apartheid, where you have this very socialist, somewhat socialist into the African National Congress mm. ends up being a fairly, but not, you know, precise neoliberal kind of free market oriented set of policies. You're like, that's an interesting question. But when mm. you look at the literature, they say, well, all of the post-Cold War states went in this direction. But the reason states like Poland and Hungary and all that went their direction were radically different than South Africa's experience. And then, you know, Helen Milner and I forget her co-author had this idea that, you know, states embrace these things because as states around them do it, they alter the cost benefit calculus. But as I looked at the record, I didn't see any evidence of that. So the research question came to be, how is it for all these re historical and empirical reasons, you would not expect them to go down this path? they went down this path and the mm. existing explanations don't seem to apply. Mm. And so I went there and I went diving through the records and I got to go through like the ANC archives in Fort Hare. And mm. I've, I've read handwritten letters by Nelson Mandela. His cursive mm. is very intense. Right. So there's a lot of interesting things with that, you know? And so I was basically studying post-apartheid uh, economic policy, kind of mm. dry, but very theoretical stuff uh, at the end of the day. And I got to spend a lot, uh, you know, a lot of time in South Africa. Uh, so that's primarily what and then it turned into a book but it the book wasn't on economic policy it was bigger it was like the nature of the state itself and i it trace it from uh, the 1800s all the way up to the present hmm. yeah. so if we um, stick uh, to your study a bit uh, what was the added value of the study what would you say what what kind of contribution did you make well one of the things you see like from guys like Archari, where they talk about the localization of norms, because he did these studies about human rights norms in Southeast Asia. He was very clear about how, you know, we have this idea of these global human rights norms, but they always take up various localized flavors. And it's partly because they get translated by local elites or people who are uh, norm entrepreneurs. But the consensus on economic policy was that it sort of followed more natural laws that, you know, as Milner was talking about the as more states trade freely with each other states who are not part of that free trade regime mm. do a rough calc, uh, you know cost benefit analysis which there's mm. no evidence for mm. Mm. and what you do find is that as i described in the in the dissertation is that the anc never gave up its goals of this emancipation and and uh, empowerment of the black majority and whatnot rectifying the wrongs of apartheid what you found was they they chose a different path to get there and so economic policy, much like norms in general, become localized, but they also get localized, not just ideologically or ideationally, they also get localized into the general socioeconomic context, the demographics of education, skill sets, but also, you know, the dominant industries and things like that. So that even policy itself mm -hmm. has this sort of second image reverse quality to it, whereby mm -hmm. there are these systemic properties, but they have to get matched by their local system processes. Mm -hmm. So that was the local val value out. It was second image reverse kind of bringing that back a little bit mm -hmm. and the localization of ideas and the extension of that towards economic policy, which is something you don't usually see uh, that in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The second image reverse is an interesting concept. Uh, or anybody, Yeah, anybody working with that at the moment? I mean, <laughs> once upon a time, it was... Yeah. Well, uh, it was Gorovich that coined that. Gorovich, yeah, but yeah. Bob Cohane, mm. uh, a number of years ago, yeah. when they had this sort of like eight, 100 influential essays on political science, he was mm. like writing that we should re we should embrace this again. Yeah, and then like Vincent, it. yeah, Vincent Mahler yeah. and a couple others kind of did it. Uh, this guy named Zara Cole, I want to say, he did it on Thailand, mm. uh, but it never caught it never caught on. Uh, but the idea that the, the political boundaries are just that political boundaries and that our analysis ought to really be looking at this back and forth, what I now today would talk about how uh, processes operate across scales, that's essentially what second image reverse.
she was talking about. And it's interesting that Cohen only mentioned this in his little three to five page thing and an otherwise throwaway book that, you know, you give to intro students or something, but he doesn't do it anywhere else. He doesn't, he doesn't even engage that research himself, but he's like, it's a good idea. Yeah. It's like 40, but that article was written the year I was born. That's why I'm like, wow, this has been around and it hasn't been as influential as I thought. Yeah. Yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah. I am working on a paper that actually tries to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uphill battle. Yeah. 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 Send it to me. I can read it. Um, uh, would, but if we, if we return to the South Africa case, would you say mm. that, um, um, uh, would you say that uh, when you talk about localization of norms, uh, in this, yeah. in, in, uh, now I am more curious about the empirical case here, would you say that the, what you call localization of norms is the same as the concept or similar to the concept of decoupling, where we have somebody that is uh, talking the talk, but not walking the walk. So there is actually not really much of a, of a following of those norms, so implementation of those norms, apart, yeah. from the, apart from the talking of those norms. Yeah, Patrick Bond, has a, he's a South African scholar. He has his book called uh, Talk Left, Walk Right. Yeah. Uh, but no, I actually don't see it that way because what you, when you look at like the way then finance minister Trevor Manuel and uh, later uh, Tabo Mbeki, the president at the time, when they started mm -hmm. developing the growth economic and uh, redistribution programs, moving away from the uh, reconstruction and development programs. These were the major policy programs for like extending electrification, housing, uh, you know, expanding, uh, you know, private investment, getting rid of state owned industries within mm -hmm limits and whatnot these are big policy programs and you go from what the rdp is this kind of somewhat leftist lean sort of thing where nationalism is still on the table towards gear which is very free market what you don't find is this idea of kind of a two-faced reality or that we use the window dressing of leftism and progressive politics but the critics in south africa definitely see it that way heinz mm. murray patrick bond are mm. definitely examples of that Yeah. Um, you know, Pariachi and all these other guys, they, they definitely think that it's almost two-faced to a degree. But when you start looking at their negotiations, you start looking at the processes mm -hmm. of how these unfold, what you find is that in so many ways, you see these actors, these individuals trying to articulate their vision within a context that's saying, this is the reality, it's narrowing the scope. Mm -hmm. And You know, the, the global economy and economists in general have that way of telling you that only this is realistic, that there are natural laws that you will uh, ignore at your peril. Mm. And you watch that internalization process occur, mm. whereby, you know, I, I think at one point during my dissertation, um, uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the defense, someone mm. said, why didn't you do interviews? And I said, well, psychologically, when people make their decisions, they don't really remember the ambiguity that the historical mm. record might say. They rationalize it. And yeah, all of them yeah. say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. William yeah. Gumid had this book about that period who said, mm. people criticize their decisions, but it was the best one we could, be, we could make. Mm. When you look through the, the record, you can see them struggling with this sort of thing. Mm. So mm. I tried to figure out exactly how they came to see it that way. Not that they mm. were hypocrites or anything mm. like that. Mm. Far from it. Mm. Um, but how they managed to reconcile what We could say are socialists. I don't. I don't think it matters much. But genuinely, their goals were the upliftment of the black majority in a way not unlike the the, the way the apartheid state did it for white people, mm. because mm. apartheid was, if anything, nothing more than a massive. It was a racist state, but nothing more than a massive uh, white welfare program, mm. which left them at the end of apartheid highly educated and fairly wealthy. They mm. no longer needed the state. They could do it. They wanted to do the exact same thing with the black majority. And that's understandable. But they were convinced over time that they couldn't do it in the same way, that they would have to do it in a quasi free market way. Mm. And I, earlier I mentioned that, you know, talking about state owned industries, they didn't really privatize all of them, not the ones mm. that made money. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Only the ones that were inefficient. Yeah, 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 mm. yeah, yeah. And so in that way, they actually were smarter than some of the former um, East European states that just got rid of everything mm. for some mm. stupid ideological reason. They're like, no, 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 let's hold on to a couple of these. These mm. bad boys pay for things. Mm. And mm. that was smart. Mm. You know? mm. So mm. that's what I mean. It's kind of a hybrid. 
It's a very yeah. syncretic outcome, but I would, yeah. I don't think they're hypocritical. I don't anything, any way like that. Yeah. I, I just don't understand how they came to see the world in such a limited vision. Yeah. That's all. Interesting. Um, okay. So during the PhD process, uh, what were some of the challenges that you encountered? I'm a very abstract person and trying to boil things down into something that makes sense to other people who haven't necessarily read everything I've read is very mm. tricky. Mm. And I'm not going to lie. I, I used to live in this old house, maybe not old by you Swedish people and Europeans where mm -hmm. our house was built in 1700s, Connecticut. Okay. It was pretty old uh, by America's standards. Yeah, it's it, quite it, old. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, not super old. Mm. And it was like five, six of us living in this house, a bunch of history majors. I'm the only social scientist. And I was struggling with these, the finer details of the proposal. Mm. And uh, one night, all of us took a bunch of mushrooms. I know. And uh, I got to chatting about it. And uh, for whatever reason, I used to carry a recorder with me. Yeah. And, we, and I had yeah. it on. And yeah. uh, they were all historians. So yeah. I knew I was always going to have to try and you say dumb things yeah. down, but simplify in a way. Yeah. And I got to thinking about the principal problem and I was talking to him about it. And I, at some point I was like, wow, I think I did a really good job of explaining it. And my buddy Aaron was like, yeah, that makes to total sense. And I had a recording of it. Yeah. And even though it was way longer than it needed to be, I was la <laughs> later just write the whole thing down and translate yeah. it. And yeah. it, it literally became the core thesis uh, of my uh, dissertation. Wow. After, <laughs> after mushrooms. With revision, but you know, remember uh, Kerouac sat in sat in a bathroom and high on meth and wrote on the road, but he edited it. Yeah. So yeah, just keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. This is no PhD advice. So uh... no, 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 no. Uh, don't be like uh, Kerouac or yeah. like me. Yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, interesting way of um, uh, taking on that challenge. <laughs> talk uh, it out it's all yeah. you gotta do is talk it out yeah uh, okay so um recommend i mean this no then you you cannot include that in the recommendations then but uh, any recommendations for the students contemplating doing a phd if we have a student here a master student that is contemplating doing doing a phd what are some I of mean, your advice or recommendations I mean, I come out of poli sci where mm. IR is just one subfield. In poli sci, uh, I think a little bit like economics, uh, there's a fair number of the PhDs who end up in the policy world and think tanks and whatnot. You can do mm. that. But the truth is the bulk of us end up as academics. And academia mm. as a job market is tough. Mm. I am, I'm a Minnesotan. I, I love Minnesota. And I would desperately like to get back to Minneapolis. But the reality is that it's going to take a long time for me to go home. I'm kind of envious for you to at least be able to be in Sweden for that regard. I'm, you know, I'm thousands of miles away from the place I call home and snow. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so, 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 so despite this nomadic lifestyle, you still the, prefer, you, you still prefer sedentary life and you still prefer the nomad. Have, yeah. The I mean, nomad I can, has roots. Yeah. Avalon, Avalon Wall says the man travels so that he can always go home. Okay. But the reality okay, is okay. that, you know, you do have to bounce around a little yeah. bit. I, I'm paraphrasing, yeah. it, yeah. I'm paraphrasing yeah. him, but um, you do have to accept that because yeah. you're just not going to end up precisely where you want to be. Yeah. And yeah. if you're willing to do that and you are someone who embraces ideas for the sake of ideas and you genuinely like doing it, it's not that big, not that big of a deal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, it's quite nice. I, I can't imagine doing anything else yeah. with my personality. Absolutely yeah. not. I only had one yeah. corporate job yeah. and I was fired very quickly. Mm, mm. so you know that yeah <laughs> yeah so the recommendation is or the advice is i don't know if there is an advice but at least there is an love understanding it. of the situation yes that is, this is very tough to it can uh, be, but yeah. if you love it do it yeah yeah you should still but do embrace it, it mm. you know it's like when you're yeah. hiking you know it's going to be a little uncomfortable but there's something about it you still want mm. Mm. know All what right. you're getting into and you can accept it yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that. I think, uh, yeah, listening to you and your PhD experience was um, really interesting. And I think um, we can uh, heed your advice, uh, oh. apart from the mushrooms, perhaps. <laughs> but yeah. Well, yeah. Hmm? It worked for me and it worked for, <laughs> you know, Hunter S. Thompson and Kerouac. That's yeah. all I can say. Yeah. All right. Uh, but thanks a lot. Really interesting to hear. And you, you, uh, you're at uh, Nottingham University now, uh, Malaysia campus, right? If yes, University of Nottingham. Yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, we can find you on Google Scholar, right? You can. You can even find me on YouTube on a local news program. Consider this. They occasionally drag me on there to explain American politics. So mm, great. All right. All the very best, Eric. Thanks for All right, participating. Later, All the best. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, man. Thanks.